You're listening to the Futures Podcast with me, Luke Robert Mason. On this episode, I speak to startup founder and author, Wendy Liu. You know, we need to think about collective action and collective solutions. We need to envision a new paradigm for how society should be governed. Wendy shared her thoughts on the perils of startup life, how Silicon Valley is dealing with issues of inequality, and what can be done to reclaim technology's potential for the public good. This episode is an edited version of a recent live stream event. You can view the full unedited video of this conversation at futurespodcast.net. Silicon Valley is often heralded as the epicenter for innovation and meritocracy. But in her new book, Abolish Silicon Valley, Wendy Liu raises a serious concern over the sustainability of the tech industry's growth at all cost economic model. She does this through the form of a memoir, charting her own experiences as a young software engineer in the Bay Area, from ruthlessly pursuing a role at Google before succumbing to startup life. Wendy reveals how the environment in which she hoped to build a flourishing career only allowed her to do so if she actively chose to ignore and externalize the negative effects of big tech. Today, she's now turned her skills to understanding the radical ways technology can be developed to benefit society at large. So, Wendy, I want to kick off by asking, I guess, the obvious question. uh, What was the reason behind writing a book calling for the abolition of Silicon Valley? The catchphrase, abolish Silicon Valley, it started actually as a Twitter joke. I think um, people were talking about abolishing ICE on Twitter that day. And, you know, just the term like abolition, people were just coming up with riffs on it. And so I said, well, what if we just abolished Silicon Valley? And a surprising number of people seemed to seem to agree. And then after that, I ended up going on a couple of different podcasts. And both of those podcast hosts independently use the term abolish Silicon Valley as the title. And because of that, I guess it just, it kind of stuck around. It was rattling around my brain. When you're in the kind of tech bubble, it's very easy to just think of only the positives of the industry. And there isn't really much of an explanation for why some people would not be happy with it. But I had always felt a little bit of discomfort. And even in things like interacting with an Uber driver or, you know, a food delivery worker, I would be thinking, well, this person is getting paid so much less than I am. And there's something about this that feels a little off, and I'm not really sure why that's happening. So I started a master's degree at the London School of Economics in their inequalities program, and it gave me a deeper understanding of the problems of the system. Throughout the the course of that, I I felt like I was starting to piece together a better understanding of why why the industry was not necessarily as amazing as it seemed, and also why I didn't know until just now. I think what's really interesting about the tech industry is that there's such an ideological bubble such that the people within it, they may really believe that they are doing the greater good or, you know, they're, that they're, that because they mean well, because they think they're doing well, you know, they, it's very easy for them to not understand the ways in which they're actually doing harm just because of the position that they're in and the fact that they're not necessarily going to hear from voices who are negatively impacted by the work that they're doing. And that definitely helped me see the world in a new light. And so I wanted to write the book as a way of explaining to others who may be struggling with the similar feelings of discomfort and discontent that I had been feeling um, and help them understand that not only is there is there a way forward, but that there's a path for themselves. So I'm not I'm not just saying, you know, everything about this industry is bad. I'm not I'm not trying to negate people's own feelings of optimism about the industry. I think there are some amazing things associated with the industry, the culture of innovation, of invention, of, you know, just like really focusing on a problem and getting, digging into it and just doing what you can with it. I think that's great. I think we do need more of that. But I do also think that the way the industry is set up right now, just the structures that shape it, they are not conducive to creating products that are good for humanity as a whole. And I think that that is the central shame. I think the talent of a lot of people in the industry is being wasted. And you know, the thing is a lot of them do know it. I've talked to many people in the industry who feel like they're not 
using their education and their skill set and their abilities to their full potential. You know, they've trained really hard to get to where they are. And then they end up uh, working at Google and making a button like more square or changing the colors of something. And they're like, why, why am I doing this? Right. I, I thought I was going to do something better with my abilities. So I think that's the shame. And I think it's also... It's something where um, I don't think individual action is going to be the solution, which is why I talk about abolition as this like structural solution. Um, I don't think individual people saying, I don't like the tech industry, I'm just going to do something different is going to fix the problem. It might be good for them. It might be better as a step forward. But I think overall, we need larger changes. And so what I'm trying to say in the book is, uh, you know, we need to think about collective action and collective solutions. Um, we need to envision a new paradigm for how society should be governed. The book is written as this um, half memoir, half expose kind of hybrid. And in the book, what you really do is you chronicle your attempt at startup life. In fact, you created a platform which you described as Tinder for advertisers. So I guess my question is, seriously, Wendy, what the hell were you thinking? In, in my in my defense, so we didn't actually build Tinder for advertisers. That was just one of the use cases that we thought could be good. <laughs> we never ended up building that product. This is one of those things where if I look back on it, I, I want to like slap myself, right? But at the time, everything just felt so natural because, you know, we started out with this idea for the kind of software we could build. We were looking around at other companies in the ecosystem and we thought, here's where our competitors are. We'll just do what they do and we'll somehow do it better. Um, we had a lot of, uh, you know, the the hubris of like a 20, 22 year old trying to do something thinking, yeah, oh, this person, this company has taken $10 million in funding and they have a thousand people. That's fine. You know, we can do better than them. That was kind of what was driving me. It's just this um, self-confidence, uh, arrogance, really, that didn't really come from anywhere. But that I think is pretty widespread in the industry. You do need quite a bit of that to get anywhere. The product we ended up building, it was it was kind of like we'd had this technical architecture and this, you know, this technical way of approaching a problem, but we didn't have a use case for it. And so we're just kind of like, well, let's see what makes money. And we spent a lot of time pivoting. And what I chronicle in the book is is our attempts to find an actual use case because every single week we would have a new niche. It would be e-commerce. It would be advertising. It would be um, political data campaigns. It, you know, we just didn't know what we were doing. We were trying to find our position within an already crowded ecosystem that we barely understood and we didn't really care about. And so I think it was partly that we were, we just didn't approach it the right way. Like, but at the same time, this was the method that we followed was one that we thought everyone was supposed to follow it. It, we had interpreted all the, um, you know, the startup advice that was out there. We'd read all the books, we read all, all the blogs, we followed all the VCs on Twitter. And they were basically saying, you know, figure out what your customers want, start from somewhere small. It doesn't have to be amazing, just build what you think the ecosystem is missing. And we took that advice, but we didn't, the problem is we didn't actually have a good sense of what we wanted to achieve. And we also just didn't have a good moral code. And so when it, we got to the point where we were basically taking data from people's Twitter and Instagram accounts and trying to figure out what we could do with it, there was a part of me that was like, this is a little creepy, Um, but also it's really cool. (laughs) That's what I like about uh, sort of the the degree of naivety within the book. You were just trying to solve a problem. And the the weird empathy that I have for someone like Mark Zuckerberg is at least when he tried to start Facebook, he had a mission to change the world. You know, he wanted to do something that was going to be a uh, world changing. And then that original mission, it got co-opted and it got co-opted by his investors who made him pivot into creating this global surveillance system for marketers. And, and my concern is that today, uh, what it feels like is a lot of these kids who are going into the startup area no longer have that lofty ambition. They're, they're actually just building tools for marketers and for advertisers to enable them to make a quick buck. And I, I just wonder, are things worse today? Are things worse now than they were when you were in Silicon Valley? Mm, I mean, just a quick point on that Zuckerberg thing. I think when he initially started Facebook, he was just trying to like compare the attractiveness of, of women, right? I'm sure it got better later on. But you know, initially, all he wanted to do was like rank girls based on how hot they were. So it's like, let's, let's not forget that. I think that is kind of crucial to the way the, the industry works and the way a lot of people think. But I think that's that's a great question. The industry is very polarized right now in a way that reflects the rest of the world, really, because I I think there are a lot of people who are thinking the way you describe where all they want to do is build something that makes money and that 
makes them successful. They want to create like a hundred million dollar run rate company. And then eventually from there, they'll start a new company or they'll work at a venture capital firm or they'll do the TED Talk circuit or something. I think there are people who think more in terms of what their company will do for them than what what their company will do for the world. And so, you know, they'll do some blockchain or e-commerce thing, not because they care about it, because they're like, well, this is what the industry is rewarding right now. This is what will get me funded. And once I do this, once I, you know, finish this like mobile gaming play, then I can do what I really want to do, which yeah. is, you know, Go not really sure. <laughs> yeah, it's something like space. that. Buy like 10 houses, right? Like who really knows? I think, yeah, I think there are definitely people who are more driven by the financial incentives. Even if they tell themselves that what they really want to do is build something cool, I think the the fact is there's just so much money in this space right now and that even the purest intentions will be corrupted by the fact that you can become a billionaire seemingly overnight just by convincing the right people that you know you're a genius. I think that's a huge problem. On the other hand, I also see a backlash um, and that comes in the form of People who've been working in the industry for a long time and are disillusioned by it and who are, you know, quitting their companies or starting something new or otherwise just taking a stand. And so in the last few years, we've heard a lot of people tell their stories of just being disillusioned and quitting, you know, Google or something after like 10 years. Sometimes they're getting fired by the company because they're organizing, they're doing activism within it. And that's, that's I think, a pretty strong current. And I also see a big trend among younger people who, who are still in university or um, even in high school or who are just entering the industry who are more skeptical of the myths that the industry likes to tell. And so instead of just saying, I'm just going to get a job and climb the career ladder, they're thinking like, I want to do some sort of activism within the industry. You know, they, they want to organize around uh, diversity, around ethics, around the many blind spots that the industry has today. And so, yeah, I think we have a really weird world where you have, you know, two different trends where you have the people who are drawn to the industry because of the money, because of the prestige. And then you have those who just want to make it better and who are not happy with the way things are. And I think those trends, like the way those trends mix, that's going to tell us a lot about what the industry looks like in the future. I mean, this was the funny thing about reading your book and reading your story. You, you were this young hopeful and you were hoping to break into Silicon Valley and have this massive startup, which, which eventually, and spoiler alert, but eventually failed. And then you went to the London School of Economics and it's there you learn about politics and you learn about social justice and you learn about inequality and you learn about civics. And I, I guess my question is, do you think that if more of these tech bros just stayed in school, we wouldn't be in this situation in the first place? Great question. Um, I, I do think there is a need for more humanities and you know ethics type education within the industry, but I also don't think that's enough. In a sense, like the biggest part of my education was not actually going to lectures. It was getting involved in activist circles and meeting people who were out from outside my tech bubble you know, meeting people who just, for whom the economy was not working. And that was something that was quite new to me because when I was in university, most of the people I surrounded myself with at, at least had, you know, pretty decent job prospects. Or if they didn't, I could find some way to write it off. I could say, oh, they they just studied a bad major, therefore, whatever, you know, it's, it's fine. But then in London, I met so many more people who were from very different socioeconomic backgrounds. I could tell like these people, they're, they're very determined. They're very thoughtful. They're very kind. They're great people. And I felt these people deserve better in life than the lot they're being given. They deserve better than being crushed under student loan debt, um, from being unable to ever like live in sort of economic stability. You know, they, they deserve better. That for me was a bigger catalyst than, you know, learning about these theories in the abstract because the theories in the abstract are good, but on some level, there has to be this kind of moral force behind it. And I think that comes from our interactions with other people and whether we identify with them. I think, you know, it'd be good if uh, more people in the tech industry did humanities and social sciences, but I also think they need to just talk to people who are not like them and find a way to put themselves in other people's shoes and think like, oh, you know, if I were my Uber driver, how would I want Uber to work? Like if, if I actually just identified with this person who is in a much worse situation than me economically, how do I want the world to be governed? That's for me is the crux of the problem. The socioeconomic system we're in is not suitable for most people. It's rewarding, you know, a small number of people more than others and 
And so the the end result is just suboptimal compared to what we could have if it was more, more fair. Do you think that the folks who work at these sort of companies should actually be forced to uh, to do some form of civic action? It, it always shocked me that when I'd go down to Twitter in San Francisco, they, they were so happy to share the fact that all of the sushi that they didn't eat at lunchtime, they would give out to the homeless community around Twitter. And I just sat there thinking, well, okay, that's, that's lovely, but you're not solving the problem of homelessness. You're just putting a plaster on it and you have excess surplus of all this and the very nice food and you need to get rid of it somehow. So this just figures to be a, an optimal way of doing it. That's kind of the way in which it feels like these sorts of companies think about civic engagement. Is there a way we can get the uh, Google interns, for example, to not uh, be playing, uh, what is it you say in the book, but not playing Quidditch and all the games <laughs> we assume that these uh, interns are playing and drinking games these interns are playing, but force them to go out into the community of San Francisco and actually do some good on the ground? Uh, that is a great question. Um, I, the thing is, I, a lot of these companies do make their employees do some sort of volunteering. Like when I was at Google, um, you know, a bunch of interns and I, we all volunteered at a food bank. It was funny because Google got the credit for that. I think the reason these companies do things like donate their food or make their employees do volunteering or, you know, donate to good causes is it gives them it makes them look good. It makes them look like they care. And, you know, they're not they're not doing it for purely benevolent reasons. They're doing it for PR reasons. And so, yeah, I think a, a lot of other tech companies also encourage their employees to volunteer for food banks and things like that. I don't think that's enough, right? Because I think it's easy for someone to do that and think, okay, I've done my bit. Sure, I'm, I'm making like 10 times more than, you know, the average income in this area, but I've, I volunteered for a food bank and that's enough. Mm. That's a very tempting trap to fall into because it's a way of feeling like you've done something without actually sacrificing anything meaningful. I personally don't think it's enough, but I also, you know, it's better than, it's better than people not volunteering. Sure. You know, what I would love to see is a way for people to volunteer or for money to be donated to good causes without the names attached, you know, without it being like, this was a million dollar donation from Salesforce or from Google or from Jeff Bezos. Because then otherwise, you know, they're just doing it to recycle their reputations. They 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 want to sound like this amazing person so that, you know, re reporters will be nicer to them and their employees will be happier about working there. I don't know what the solution is there, but I think this city, San Francisco in particular, we have a lot of um, a lot of charitable giving that isn't really as charitable as it seems, where you have people who have made their money through essentially just underpaying their workers. And then they're donating that money in a way that makes them look good. But, you know, it's always on their terms. They're always the ones who decide where that money goes to. Community groups don't necessarily have a say. And there's always a string attached. It's always like, you can't criticize this company. In the book, you look at sort of how Silicon Valley got this way. And the, the word that keeps coming up is the idea of meritocracy. It feels like that's what's at the heart of Silicon Valley. And in a funny sort of way, it's, it's what's at the heart of our current system. But meritocracy is actually really problematic. And could you explain why that's such an issue that you identify in the book? It's so funny. Um, I actually thought meritocracy was something that Silicon Valley had invented. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And so it really, it really threw me for a it loop when Wall I started. Street first, and then it was Silicon Valley. <laughs> no, but Wall Street messed it up. But Silicon Valley got it right. That's that's kind of the the way people talk about it. But yeah, it really just m messed me up when I started reading, you know, social sciences texts that talked about meritocracy from way way back before Silicon Valley was invented. I got to thinking whether you know this idea of meritocracy is it really something that the people in the industry care about, or is it more of a cover? an excuse. When, when someone asks them, why don't you have any women? They say, oh, meritocracy, just women are just not good enough. There aren't enough women studying computer science in schools. And so I think in the industry, there are definitely people who believe in the good sense of meritocracy, where it's that, you know, we should allow people to flourish, to do what they're good at. But it feels these days like it's become more of a, an excuse when, you know, when people are asked, why does your company just literally not employ any women in high ranking roles, they always end up saying something like, well, you know, we don't want to lower the bar because we believe that the best should rise to the top. And if women aren't rising to the top, it's because there's something, something else going on. It's nothing to do with us. It's nothing to do with our biased hiring patterns or even society as a whole. 
that's extremely frustrating to hear. But there definitely was a time when I really believed in the idea of meritocracy. And I believed that the tech industry operated in a purely meritocratic fashion. Because, you know, there is a lot of rhetoric around that. Um, the company GitHub, which was acquired recently by Microsoft for a staggering amount of money, when they were this uh, kind of like young, hot startup, they were, they were my favorite company, right? I would read their blog post every day. I wore their hoodie and their t-shirts all the time. I was really proud to just know about this company. And they got into a bit of trouble a few years ago when they, so they raised a lot of money from Andreessen Horowitz, and then they decorated their office in this way where they had a rug on the floor that said the United Meritocracy of GitHub or something like that. And it was just, it was like, at the time, they had a very tiny number of female engineers. And in fact, one of their female engineers would go on to accuse the company of discrimination, uh, among other things. And so at the time, I remember looking at it and hearing about the backlash and thinking, oh, it's just feminists, right? It's just, you know, social justice warriors. It's just people who are who can't make it in the industry who are complaining. Because I, I really believed that that there weren't structural issues. I really thought that the industry rewarded people according to their talent. And it took several more years of paying attention to the backlash before I kind of figured out, oh, well, there are these structural problems. And, you know, I was just stubborn and obstinate and refused to recognize them. But just because nothing that bad has happened to me yet doesn't mean it never will. And it also doesn't mean that it works for everyone else. The myth of meritocracy is a very strong one because it's, it's very tempting. And I think for, for people who have done well in the industry, it's especially tempting because you you want to believe that the system is fair. You you know, if you've if you've won like if you've succeeded in a game, you want to think it's because you were really good at that game and it's a good game. But if the dice is weighted, then it doesn't really matter, does it? Yeah, but you know, then no, no one really wants to think about that. Mm. So I think it's it's very it's very hard to explain to someone who's who has done very well in the industry and wants to believe in this idea of their own talent and their own hard work that the reason they've done well is less a reflection of themselves and more a reflection of how the structures are set up. We're starting to see so much of this, um, I think it's been termed the tech lash. And then this book kind of falls into the category of tech lash nonfiction. And I guess everybody's lining up to be Cassandra. And I guess I should start calling you Cassandra instead of Wendy. Uh, the Cassandra of Silicon Valley. Everybody wants to be the ones to sort of ring the bell and go, oh, go gosh, this thing is really, really bad. And But it's one thing to say that there's a problem. But what do you actually do to change it? How do you you get into the weeds and change it. Was it Sean Rad who had his moment. We had um, uh, the author of Zucks, one of the key investors of uh, Facebook, who was ringing the bell and saying, oh, goodness, this stuff is uh, is terrible. And do you think that tech lash is actually uh, hopeful? Or is the reality they're just saying that to, to make themselves feel better about this rubbish situation, but they're going to still ride the wave until it finally collapses under its own dead weight? That was very poetic. Um, I think that's a great question. I, I guess I like I don't necessarily want to be cynical about the motives of people who are, you know, ringing the bell. I think it's whatever their motives are. I think it's good that we're having these conversations because there are people who have been critiquing the tech industry for years. Mm. You know, since any company became prominent, there's always been someone, you know, a, a frontline worker, maybe uh, an academic, maybe some a journalist who's been saying there are problems with this and those problems will pop up like crop up very soon but those people have not necessarily been given that much spotlight and now that we have all these high profile people who were you know formerly insiders in the industry who are now saying the industry is flawed i think that's good i think it's better to have just more of a spotlight on these things than to have them hidden away and even if these people are doing it for maybe self-serving reasons it's fine i think you know at the end of the day we all have to be somewhat self-serving just to get out of bed what what i would really like to see of the of the tech lash is just to have more attention on the voices of people who are traditionally ignored because mm -hmm. you know the the roger mcnamee's uh, tristan harris's of the world their voices are great but also they're telling one part of the story and I think the the voices we need to hear now are the people who are dealing with this on the front lines. And when I say that, I mean, if we're talking about the gig economy, we should be listening to Uber drivers. We should be listening to Deliveroo cyclists. If we're talking about the problems of Amazon, then we really need to hear from the workers, uh, including the software engineers, but not just those like the, you know, the warehouse workers, delivery workers, anyone in the, the kind of supply chain. I think 
the voices of the workers are often just ignored because it's assumed that they don't know anything. They, they don't know enough to have like a critical understanding. But the way I think about this now is that if you don't listen to their voices, then you're missing a piece of the puzzle. I almost have like this kind of technical analogy for this where, you know, if you're a software engineer and you have a program that's buggy, how are you going to fix it? You don't fix it just by like writing on a blackboard. Here's how I'm going to fix it. You have to look at the bugs. Mm -hmm. You have to investigate all the ways in which the program is not working and like pay close attention to all the failures. And that I found to be, you know, a pretty good metaphor for how I think about like society today. You know, I think it's so important to just look at the ways that society is failing people and just understand, really deeply understand what that failure looks like. And then what can we do about it? Once you kind of tally up enough of those, then you have a better sense of what's wrong and what can you do to fix them? What do you think the ones who are trapped in this system, who know that there's something fundamentally wrong, what do you think that they do? I mean, what advice do you have to founders who who really feel trapped? You know, the sorts of folks who that they become part of the system and then they have these expectations from their employees and they have the expectations from these investors and these expectations from their users and suddenly they become a slave to this little gadget or gizmo that they built and it feels like they have no escape. I mean, how do they sort of stand up and go, you know what, I, I just want off of this roller coaster? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think my first piece of advice to those people would be, you know, you're not alone. Mm. It's not your fault. There's only so much you can do as an individual in the system to accomplish something while staying true to your own morals. And for many people, I think they'll find that the system is just simply not set up to allow them to accomplish what they want to do. It's not designed to help enterprising young Stanford grads create social good. It's designed to create returns for investors. What that means is that some people will either have to change their morals and change their ideas of what they want to achieve, or they'll be very disappointed. That disappointment, it doesn't have to remain an individual thing because so many people are having the same disillusions and they're having the same kind of problems with the industry. And what I really hope that people in those situations you mentioned will do is realize that there are others like them and it doesn't have to be this way. And, and it's hard. It's very hard to do that as an individual. But I think grounded with an understanding that there are better ways of having innovation, of you know having entrepreneurship, then maybe that'll give them a little more solace and knowing that the situation they're in is not just is not just a personal failing. It's not just that they weren't good enough. It's that the system is broken. And what they should do is hopefully take that that energy, that the disappointment, and turn it into this kind of resolve to push for something better. Or not push for anything at all. I mean, and it goes back to that meritocracy point. Anybody who you know, goes out in the sun and, and and lays back and has a good time and a and a, a quote unquote healthy but maybe not financially prosperous life, they're seen as uh, failures by society. Whereas anybody who builds a, a multi billion dollar company that takes advantage of gig workers is seen as an abject success. So, uh, how do we balance those two? How do we, I guess, re-engineer a value system whereby just just being happy and just being human is an achievement. You know, it feels like in, in many ways in, in this world, sometimes just being happy and healthy and human is the hardest thing to do. It's much, much harder to have that than to run a, a multi-billion dollar tech startup. Completely agreed. I think as a society, we've started to value the wrong things. We value ruthlessness. We value mm. the ability to scale and the ability to be ambitious, ambitious without thinking like, what is that ambition for? What is the purpose of that? Or are we just valuing naked ambition in itself? And Silicon Valley is pretty much the epitome of that. I mean, Wall Street was probably the epicenter for a while, but now Silicon Valley is where a lot of people are gravitating towards because it's where the money is. I think that's a huge that's a huge problem, and it's it's really sad. The problem is it's it's not just that. We're create we're, we have the wrong incentives and we're creating the wrong kinds of products. I think it's also very dangerous for the people who are are made to believe that this is true, right? Mm -hmm. The people who fall for the illusion, the people who think that as long as they just keep working hard, as long as they you know work eighty hours a week like Elon Musk and they raise lots of money, and all of their friends and family are you know jealous of their success, then they'll be happy as if that is like 
a way to live as if that's the only way to live. And there's this wonderful book on the, on the, on the topic called um, How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell, which I really recommend to anyone who's interested. It's a book about the attention economy, but it's also a book about how to just survive, how to live as a human being. And the book suggests that we can have other ways of thinking about what's valuable than just the, the economic value system that we've been given. We don't have to view everything in terms of the dollar price it would fetch on the market. We can value things that are typically you know, disregarded by capitalism. We can value art. We can value ecology. We can value caring for each other, right? And those things are, they're so important to just having a, like a grounded life, right? Like being in a society with other people, with the natural world, with all the things that we can create the economic value system that has unfortunately come to dominate our world, it doesn't capture the multiplicity of things that make life worth living. You know, it's just such a narrow lens through which to see the world. And even though we all know that on some level, it's hard to live that way. And I think it's very easy for people within a certain, um, a certain bubble, like a Silicon Valley bubble or a Wall Street bubble or whatever it is, it's easy for them to forget that there is a, a life in a world beyond capitalism, yeah. right? That, you know, there are things that have meaning that you can't treat as an asset and that, that it's okay. Even in the realization of that, the folks in Silicon Valley and realizing that their approach to it is, oh goodness, we're losing our ability to be connected, to meditate, to be well, to be calm. And what ends up happening or what ends up emerging is, is this thing called the, the wellness industry and we have this commodification of calm whereby Silicon Valley is now creating apps, applying the logic of tech to our mental and physical well-being and just doing the same old shit that they were doing or the previous time anyway. So I just wonder, are we going down a dangerous path here? I signed up for a Vipassana meditation. And the wonderful thing about 10 days of silent meditation is there's no commodification. You don't have to buy anything or purchase anything. And I've had Calm and all the meditation apps to try and find a way to achieve uh, a meditative state. But doing 10 days of Vipassana, whereby you didn't pay for it, it was gifted, it was an exchange whereby you donate at the end, it, it felt very, very pure. There was no economics or capitalism involved. And what it gave you was the skill set of how to meditate. And it took a hundred hours to learn that. Unfortunately, I couldn't download that. And I just wonder, uh, by all of this uh, rise of new age spiritualism and people going, oh God, you know, this is, this is going to be the new thing. We feel so overworked. What, how do we get our, our minds back? Uh, what people end up doing is going, oh, we're going to create apps for that. So uh, Wendy, are we going down a dangerous path here? Are we just going to end up in exactly the same situation again in about three or four or five years when we realized all those meditation apps, all they were really doing was siphoning data about the best times that we were calm so that they could feed us the right sort of ad or or the right sort of uh, upgrade within app. You're at the calmest moment. Just buy this upgrade or this or this person to to come and do your your <laughs> meditation for you. Wow, that's a dark prediction. I think you're you're probably right about where this is going. Um, and I think the the way I see it is, Silicon Valley is this uh, is strange bubble and microcosm where, you know, you know the expression where when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm. When you've been trained in the Silicon Valley mindset, everything looks like some sort of startup opportunity. Everything looks like it could be an app, like it could you know, be commodified through selling data or in-app purchases. And you know, in, in a way, like you, you have to admire the people who do that. They found a formula that works and they're just applying it to everything. The problem is while that formula might work on a small scale in a very limited set of circumstances, it doesn't work for everything. And when you have all this money flooding into Silicon Valley, and you know, I, at this point, I have to mention SoftBank. The fact that SoftBank has poured billions of dollars into the ecosystem has only just made things worse. I mean, things were already pretty bad before SoftBank, but they've just like, you know, poured fuel on the fire. Once you get to the point where the tech industry is like so big and so tied up with the rest of the financial ecosystem, then it just becomes absolutely absurd. And then you get things like the wellness industry. You have all this money in blockchain, mm -hmm. pursuing really just speculative ventures that don't really seem to offer any actual social, like they're, they're not, not even trying to be about social good. They're like, how can we create this cool new technology and maybe make some money? It's quite tragic, but what I try to do with my critique is focus on the systems and not the individuals. And so I think 
for the people who are doing this, like I don't necessarily blame them. I don't think it's their fault. I think they exist in a world where certain perspectives and certain approaches are glorified. And it's very hard to go against that, right? Like if it, if you look around you and there are all these billionaires, all these very successful people with all of these fabulous institutions, and they're all saying the same thing. They're all saying startups are great. Inequality is good. Silicon Valley is the epicenter of innovation. There's no other way to do innovation other than giving some, you know, 20 year old Stanford dropout a lot of money, then it's really hard to go against that. You know, Silicon Valley is uh, one of the new ruling classes and their ideas are going to seem like the ruling ideas. Mm -hmm. And for people who, especially those who are, who are young and who have not been exposed to other ways of seeing the world, it's just going to feel so tempting to believe that. And yeah. And so I think, you know, people who see the wellness, the wellness industry as just another way to, to monetize data, I'm like, yeah, it's tragic. It's tragic that as a society we've come to this, but also the people who are doing it, I think, you know, they're they're kind of just going for what they know. And I feel bad for them. I don't necessarily want to castigate them. I don't think it's necessarily their fault. Maybe for some of them, but I think especially those who've been taught from a young age that the secret to success is like climbing the career ladder, being really good at what you do, being ruthless in pursuit of your dreams, then that's just the only value system they know. And for me, definitely, like I talked about it a bit in the book, but I was raised to believe that educational achievement was the most important thing. And, you know, once I graduated, I would have to get like a great job and just make a lot of money. And that all that mattered was just me making a lot of money. And that as long as I did that, then I could feel good about everything else. And I think that's something that many people, especially younger people are realizing doesn't necessarily make sense. Like we're on a planet that is not doing super well. We're currently living through a pandemic that is upending all of our socioeconomic norms, right? Everything is just kind of in a state of rupture. Then the old ways that we've learned that we've internalized don't really work, but it's very hard to let go of something like that. So, you know, I feel for the people who are trying to make meditation apps and don't feel good about it, but also don't know what else to do. Well, you know, there's other ones they can download. What's so clear in the book is the impact that your peer group had on what you perceive to be success. And I just wondered, do you have any advice for folks who are looking at Silicon Valley and going, you know what, I'm going to graduate this year. I'm going to take that job at Google. Do we need some sort of intervention, Wendy? Do we need to go, no, stop, look, there are other modes that you can take and there's other ways to have a job and potentially be happy. Should we have some form of intervention at the at the graduate level or how do we communicate that there are other, other options to, uh, to have success other than starting a startup or getting an internship at Google? I think it's tricky because, you know, just to acknowledge the socioeconomic reality, for some people, getting a job at Google is like the only way to have financial stability for themselves and their families, right? You know, people, if there are people who maybe want to go into grad school, who want to become journalists or artists or something. But those career paths are all very, very fragile right now. And it's like, it's so hard to make a living and have any sort of stability if you're not working, you know, a nine to five paid for by a big, big company. What I would say to those people is like, if you feel that way, if you feel like working at a place like Google is your best bet, then do it. But just don't let yourself believe the hype. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Just try to stay critical, and, and that's going to be hard. I think, I think it's very hard to work to spend most of your waking hours at a job where you don't believe it. But at the same time, I think the the risk of believing it is like is being indoctrinated into a cult, right? And that's probably not something anyone really, really wants to do. And it, you know, I think it is so important to have a sense of perspective of what the world is actually like. And you can lose that if you spend most of your time in this really nice office you know, working on fun technical problems and just being paid a lot of money, you like, you gain this kind of distance, you kind of, you, you become out of touch, right? With what's actually happening. In that case, then I think for those people, I'd recommend talk, talk to your coworkers and talk about their gripes. Just understand that you're not alone. Like if you have any sort of disillusionment, any sort of gripes with the company, talk to your coworkers, maybe surreptitiously about them and then see if there's anything that can be done. And also just like keep up with what's happening around the world. Talk to like ordinary people, listen to podcasts, listen to public radio. Um, don't forget how difficult life is for most people on this planet. Because for me, like that's something where that, that gives me my politics, right? When I hear stories of 
Amazon delivery workers or Uber drivers or people working in factories who just um, who are just really struggling to get by. I listen to those stories and I'm like, oh, okay, now I remember why things are so bad. I remember what's important. You know, these are all other people who also deserve dignity and also deserve a place within our socioeconomic system. You've done such a wonderful job at sort of outlining the problem, but the other great thing about the book is that you actually look at some solutions. And I guess the first uh, possible solution is how we change the geographic and, and demographic diversity of Silicon Valley. That, that may not abolish it, but at least go some way in changing it. So how do you think those two things will, will help? Yeah, I, I try to lay out some solutions. I think the solutions will probably be the most controversial because, um, you know, the book is meant to cater to a wide audience. And I expect a lot of, you know, people to be angry with some of the solutions I propose. But in terms of geographic and demographic diversity, um, I think an industry that has a less homogenous array of people is one that is going to have more diverse viewpoints. And especially if the industry welcomes people who've had less privileged upbringings and are able to see the system more critically, then, you know, my hope is that they will push for more radical things. And I think this is bearing out in practice the most exciting moment of uh, like large scale moment of tech worker activism in the last few years. Uh, it's been at Google. Uh, actually, there have been a couple. So the Project Maven thing was pretty exciting, but the Google walkout was the one that got so much attention. And that was led by women. It was, a, it was an effort that was protesting the sexism of the industry. And I think that, that's really inspiring. And we need, we need more people who are courageous and also have a critical understanding of the problems of the system to step up and advocate for change because change is not going to come from the top. I think this is something that like, it took me a while to realize, but because for a while I really thought that if the leaders were just a little more ethical, they're a little kinder, then they would they would push for change. Well, they're not going to because there are structural reasons they can't, right? They answer to their shareholders. If they're too generous, then their board might just replace them with someone else. And so they have to be kind of forced to give any sort of concessions. And I think that comes from the bottom, that comes from workers coming together and collectively demanding something better. The interesting thing about some of the solutions that you that you offer is they identify the real problem. And the real problem isn't technology, it isn't these companies, but it's capitalism. It's the system under which these companies are built and these companies have to run and these companies have to operate, which really defines their priorities. But you argue that, and I mean, it's hard to do, and it's famously been said that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And I guess we're kind of close to the end of the world. So why not let's try to uh, imagine the end of capitalism? Um, you have these alternative systems, you outline these alternative systems in the book, and there's there's five of these alternative systems, and they are, you're almost teasing us with the possibility of what could be, and the first one is reclaiming entrepreneurship. You see that entrepreneurship can actually be considered a public service. So how do you envision that, that working? The media coverage of entrepreneurship is dominated by these billionaires. And, and so we associate entrepreneurship with becoming fabulously wealthy. You know, we have the Jeff Bezos, the Elon Musk's, Mark Zuckerberg's of the world, all of whom have so much money, so many billions, and they end up spending it on, I don't know, really expensive houses or whatever, islands in Hawaii. And so we have this connection that the only reason someone will want to do the hard work of creating something is if they are rewarded with all the prizes of being a billionaire afterwards. And I don't think that's true. I think that selects for a certain kind of person. And I also think that the people who are doing these things, they would still do them without the money. If we had an alternative system with a corresponding alternative culture where, you know, it, it wasn't normal to become wealthy, where you didn't know anyone who was wealthy and where wealth wasn't glamorized the same way, then I think people would still want to create things. And, you know, we have cases of this in the past where people have created amazing things. We have scientists who've come up with fabulous discoveries and done really difficult work, not because they wanted the money, but because they were motivated by the thrill of it. And some of them just made no money from their work. You know, in a way we we have a lot to thank them for. Yeah, I think there are alternate alternative ways of encouraging the kind of um, ambition and discipline that we need for, you know, for people to build something cool that isn't just, you know, giving them a billion dollars afterwards. Because I think having that much money 
it's not good for those people. It's not good for the world. It's not good for them. It really, it just, it, it like corrupts your brain, right? It makes you, it makes you see the world in this really skewed, bizarre way. I, I think it, it erodes the possibility of solidarity between people. If you have one person who's, who's no money and another person who's a billionaire, that billionaire cannot see a person who's poor in the same way. They, they cannot, they cannot interact with them as like a normal person. Well, this is where you offer another sort of interesting solution, and whether it'll ever be uh, allowed is another thing. But you argue that we should restrict CEO pay based on a ratio of the lowest pay of the person in the organization. So what you're really arguing for is giving workers more power over the way in which they're paid and, and more say over automation by restricting and tying their income to the income of the CEO. I, j- I just wonder how you envision that actually working? We've seen a few cases of this happening in practice. I, I know that in the UK, there's a John Lewis has a sort of like cap like this. It's not a very good cap, but it's better than better than nothing. And there's one company, um, I forget exactly what they do. They make some sort of software where the CEO said he would be taking the same salary as all of his employees. And that meant a big pay cut for him, but that a lot of his employees were suddenly just suddenly had a lot more money and it was seems to to be working. I think those cases are rare just because the structure does not incentivize that. It's like it's very weird if someone were to suddenly say, I'm gonna cap my own pay and pay all my workers more, you know, shareholders would not be happy. But that it, it can work. And I think what it does is that it makes people feel like they're all valued. You know, the workers are given some sort of say over the conditions in which they work and, you know, the money they're making. Um, And I think that highlights, that reflects the actual value that is created by people, right? Because I think it's ridiculous to say that a CEO is actually worth, you know, a thousand times more than someone who, who does, you know, lower wage work because like, what, what is, what are we, what is that money doing? Is money a reflection of merit? Is it a way to allocate resources according to need? Is it a way to just tell people they're amazing? Like you can't be all of these systems at once. And I think one of the huge problems with the way many of us think of money is that we think of it as something you can earn as something that you deserve if you work hard for it. But that's not the way money is allocated. Like think about all the billionaires who've inherited money from their families just for being born to the right family. There's obviously something really weird going on with that. And then at the same time, you have people who are working, you know, more than, more than um, 40 hours a week and they're making minimum wage and they still can't afford to pay rent or put food on the table. We have this system of money that's just so fluid and so multivaried and it's just, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. We can't have it do all these things. I think we need to get to a position where we can treat money as just a way to allocate the resources that people need rather than saying, you know, oh, this person is a thousand times better, more deserving than, you know, their lowest paid worker. So we should give them this much money. It just, it doesn't make sense. Let's continue down that avenue because you argue also that we should reclaim public services. In other words, you say that in exchange for work, it shouldn't always necessarily be dollars. It might actually be basic public services and we can disrupt things like healthcare and education, banking and mobility, uh, even community and housing by making it available to all who are able to work. And the funny thing is that feels like a revolutionary idea. And yet, you know, it's not been one that's been jumped on by the guys in uh, in Silicon Valley. So I just wonder that idea of ba- universal basic services, how does that factor into the world that you're envisioning post Silicon Valley? The way I see it is the mode of capitalism that we have now, where so much is left to the vagaries of the market, where you know people have to earn at least some sort of money to just be able to survive. That feels to me like a, a very legacy system. You know, it's like sure, it maybe it worked for a while, but I think we can do better. And for me, what doing better entails is giving people access to the resources they need to survive and like live a decent life, while not punishing them for valuing different things. Like if someone just wants to spare, spend their time making art, taking care of their family, just like hanging out, enjoying, enjoying the world. And it's like, that's, that's fine. I think what we need to figure out the, the big question then is how do we ensure that enough is produced that everyone actually has, you know, all the food, all the, the materials they need. I think the idea of uh, tying work to the ability to live for one, that devalues care work, which is, a, you know, the sort of work that is typically shifted towards women. And it's just treated as something that women don't deserve to get paid for 
but it's still, it's still work. It's still necessary to keep society functioning. I hope that society has gone to the point where we have advanced enough ways of um, coordinating production and communicating with each other that we can have a more humane, a more generous system where everyone is just expected to just be a good citizen, to live and to like not harm other people or like the world. And instead, maybe maybe they have to work a certain amount of hours depending on where they are and what needs to be done. But the goal should be to allow people to, to just live a flourishing life without this threat of, you know, if you don't choose the kind of work that is sanctioned by your government, then you're going to starve. Like if you don't work a low wage job at McDonald's, um, doing something you, you don't enjoy, then, you know, we just, you're just going to be homeless. You won't be able to get healthcare. And if we look at the variety of, um, different welfare systems among different countries, then I think we get a sense of the possibilities where in the U S we have such a, a stingy welfare system. And, you know, we don't even use the term austerity here because we're just kind of like living in austerity. In the UK, at least you have the NHS, even if it's being defunded, at least there's this idea that you can just be a person in the country and get healthcare and not have to go into medical debt for it. So, and you know, a lot of the Scandinavian countries have much stronger welfare systems. So I think just looking around at the world we have now, it's clear that there are better ways of doing things than that we have, you know, in the U.S. especially, you know, we definitely need political will. And I think we also just need a different way of looking at the world and like looking at our responsibilities to each other as human beings, right? Because like all of what my politics is about is this idea of solidarity and this idea of creating a system that works for everyone, a system that actually treats people with, with dignity and gives them the resources they need to just survive. We're going to take a, a couple of questions from uh, YouTube now. Uh, Gemma asks, is it possible to change things in Silicon Valley without changing things on Wall Street? In, in other words, uh, should we actually be looking at Wall Street instead of looking at uh, Silicon Valley? I do think a lot about the ties between Wall Street and Silicon Valley. Unfortunately, it's not something I know that much about. Like, I, I wish I had a better understanding of how it actually works behind the scenes and what are the avenues for change? Like, what are the levers? When I talk about Silicon Valley as being, you know, part of a larger structure, then I, you know, I also mean Wall Street. I mean the way that finance is marshaled towards these companies, that is a big part of it. And it's funny because a lot of these tech companies in the financial sphere, they'll say things like, We're gonna disrupt Wall Street, we're disrupting the, the predatory banks. And then they end up having to raise money from those banks and working with those banks. Yeah, Wall Street and Silicon Valley are highly connected even though there are many in the tech industry who would say we're better than wall street we're disrupting wall street but they still they still rely on it there's a symbiotic relationship for sure there has to be change on the level of how capital is allocated i'm not sure if that's something that will come from within wall street i feel like i'm definitely less hopeful of collective action within wall street i don't think that's something anyone's expecting anytime soon i hope regulation will play a role in that where you know it's the government has a lot of say in how Wall Street and, and the city and the UK and how these systems operate. And the reason we're in the system we have now where finance is just completely untethered from reality is mostly the result of deregulation, you know, starting in the 70s with um, Margaret Thatcher's big bang reforms. And in, in the US, we had similar deregulation happening with Wall Street. It's just, it doesn't have to be this way. The government created the conditions for finance to be so uh, so lofty, just so untethered, without any sort of oversight on what what's happening, and we can undo all those. It all it really takes is political will. It's funny because I guess what you're really arguing when you talk about reclaiming entrepreneurship is that governments should decide with public money what to fund and what not to fund, and should also, to some degree, shoulder the risk of making those sorts of decisions. It's a very anti-libertarian point of view. Do you think that's just going to fall on death ears in somewhere like Silicon Valley? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I, I think about that a lot because I want my book to be approachable to a wide variety of people, even those who are not necessarily inclined to agree with them already. And so when I talk about reclaiming entrepreneurship, for example, I'm not just talking about the government. I think there is a way of having the government be more involved. But I think when people think of the government, especially here in the US, they think of the DMV, they think of coercion, they think of taxes. And it's like, that's that's not what a government should be. I think the what the government should be doing in an ideal world is marshalling the resources 
that we've democratically, you know, agreed on and, and that like in a democratic way. And so maybe rather than a government, what I'm really just saying is we need a more democratic way of having entrepreneurship. And, and that doesn't have to be a government structure. It could be, for example, a nonprofit, if it's maybe funded in some way, it could be a union, right? You could have really strong unions that are able to fund startups and nonprofits and things like that. And there are some unions that already do that, that already do fund entrepreneurship. The goal is to have the risks of entrepreneurship not be shouldered by the individual and also have the resources allocated in a more democratic way. Because right now, I mean, what do we have? We have venture capital as an industry, which is predominantly male, predominantly white. It's mostly people who are based in some very wealthy parts of the world. And a lot of them have degrees from prestigious universities where they already have connections. There are some who are even, it's so funny, there's this one VC who's a third generation venture capitalist. And I always find that hilarious as if it's like a hereditary trait. But the point is, you know, this is not a representative group of people and they're making decisions that can in fact impact billions of people around the world. And, you know, what gave them the right to decide this? Well, they just happen to have got enough money from, you know, a previous startup or they, they just had enough money to be able to raise a fund and they were able to get people to trust them with that money. Like, why does I give them the power to do this? It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem just. And, you know, there, there are many feminist critiques of the industry, I think, that make this point where if you have all these white men who are deciding where money goes and what startups are promising, then you're going to end up with a very homogenous industry. And, kinds of startups that will be funded will not necessarily correspond to what people need. That realization hopefully is the bridge to a more expanded alternative vision of what the industry could look like if it were more democratic. I don't know exactly what that would look like. I think that's like an open question. I would love for people to just experiment with this and to talk about this more. But yeah, I just want to like throw that out there. It's just crazy to me that uh, VC companies are being treated like monarchies. And the, the, you can have third or fourth generation of, uh, of VCs. Um, we have another uh, question from YouTube, uh, this time from Ian Forrester, um, who says, Cory Doctorow talks about the problem within Silicon Valley being about monopolies. Is this a problem that you highlight, Wendy, or is it more around money and in inequality? It is important to look at monopolies. That's not the the focus of my book, I would say. The focus is more that the structural incentives are flawed. And I, I do think that ties in with the problem of monopolies in the sense that if you have a company that grows really, really big within this flawed structure, the act of it becoming a monopoly will create its own problems. And so, and so the way I see it is, yes, the monopolies are a problem, but they're not a problem just because they're big. They're a problem because they value the wrong things. And that if we, you know, we should, we should, we should be talking about how to break up these companies. I think that's a good discussion, but we should also be thinking about what else can we do to reform the structure so that we don't just have the same problem again, you know, in a few years. And also so that like the, the world we're trying to aim, aim for isn't just, you know, a slightly modified version of the world we have now, because, uh, you know, imagine if we broke up Google or Facebook so that they didn't have this advertising duopoly. And instead we had 20 companies that were all handling this advertising data. And maybe they weren't, they didn't have secure, you know, data protocols and, and it was just a giant mess. And I think in that sense, like the anti, anti monopoly approach isn't necessarily the correct one. And instead we should be thinking about, well, what is the actual problem here? What do we want less of? And, you know, I'm personally, I'm very anti-advertising in general. I think we should have a lot less advertising. I think just the the way that advertising is being targeted to us using our data, I just, I think we should have less. We don't need 10 companies handling this and competing with each other because we're they're competing for customers. They're not competing for like, for us, they're competing for advertisers. I think that that's just um, the wrong approach. I think in that case, we just need less advertising in general. And, but when it comes to other segments, I do think, you know, anti-monopoly is a useful approach. It's just not for everything. The gig economy is one where we have a lot of competition, actually. We, in, in San Francisco, there are so many different food delivery companies. You can... <laughs> so many so many different scooter apps. Yes, it's exactly. Like, oh, they're so all different many. colors. I mean, 12 apps to just hire a scooter is crazy. You know, some people like pink, some like green. But yeah, I think, I think that that highlights part of the problem in that Sometimes the problem is that there's too much competition. What we really need is 
a more unified approach where it's, I don't know, like some sort of a nonprofit, a co-op, a municipal service, anything that avoids the negatives of having too much competition. But I, you know, I do think that it is useful to talk about monopolies. It's just, for me, it's not the thing I'm concerned the most about because I think the just the the broader structure is so flawed that we have to address that first and figure out how to fix that before we talk about monopolies. Are you talking about making or forcing some of these companies to become public services when they become too large? I've always wondered the point at which Jack Dorsey would just throw his hands up and go, you know what? I can't get Twitter to make the advertising return that we promised the investors. I'm going to just hand it over to you guys. It is now a public service. Good luck at keeping the server racks on, but it is yours. Because it is a, it is really, I mean, it's the way in which the US is being governed right now, thanks to Trump, but it really does feel like a public service. Amazon for example, ever since um, COVID-19, Amazon has become retail. and Amazon is retail. The only way to get anything that isn't food or essential goods is through Amazon. And do you think at some point we should find a way to go, you know what, you've reached this scale, reward your investors accordingly, but we're going to take it from here? Yeah, for sure. I think that's, that is a very imp- important and fruitful discussion we should be having. You know, Jack Dorsey has done Stranger Things. So he might actually go for this. Um, A a friend of mine actually started this campaign to try to get Twitter to become a user cooperative, like have have the users basically buy Twitter and have some sort of structure set up. It didn't really, it didn't actually, obviously didn't actually happen, but I think there is appetite for different ways of running a company like Twitter, which has become a public service. And really, nobody really likes Twitter ads, right? Like we can, we can all use a lot fewer Twitter ads. The only reason Twitter has to monetize itself is because it's in this weird for-profit business model. And, you know, that's the only way it can justify its existence. But like, if we treat it as a public service, then we might all have a better experience and we might be able to more democratically govern the terms by which people, you know, are allowed to tweet or just are, are getting suspended and things like that. Because right now it's just, it's so hard for an ordinary person to actually have any say in how Twitter operates. Same with Amazon, same with Uber. And I think that's that's just not working. Maybe that would have worked when these companies were tiny, but once these companies become billion dollar entities that affect so many people, then we need a new model. Like this shareholder driven private corporation model, just it it doesn't suit the realities of the situation. There's another uh, question from YouTube, uh, this time from Peter, who says, uh, you, you mentioned governance being at the core of the problem. What do you think about worker co-ops or orgs that are collectively governed by values-driven communities instead of corporations? Uh, should we be looking closer at cooperatives as a potential solution to some of these issues? Or is there governance issues with cooperatives in the first place that makes them very difficult to run? Yeah, great question. I'm not an expert on co-ops, but I, I like the idea. And I think um, one of the problems that co-ops face is that they're trying to compete in a market that favors large profit-driven corporations. If you're if you're a co-op trying to compete against Uber, for example, you're not going to have a good time because Uber is backed with billions and billions of dollars, and they have access to the, the best lawyers money can buy. They can, you know, if they want, they can try to bribe politicians. And so, if a co-op tries to compete on an already uneven playing field, they're going to have a tough time. The impacts of that will be felt, you know, by the workers. So they might have to pay themselves less. They won't be able to survive very long. And so I think what needs to happen for co-ops to be more viable is there need to be structural changes that make it a more even playing field. So, you know, so that co-ops are given more funding and the rules just favor co-ops in general. And, you know, I know that to to some libertarians, this, this would sound awful. They'd be like, oh my God, you're skewing, you're skewing the free market. But I mean, the answer, of course, is that the market was never free. The market is always constructed by rules that are, they're not neutral. It's just the way things are. And instead, I think we need to shift the the balance of power back towards more community-driven efforts like co-ops. Uh, and I think, yeah, co-ops can be a really good solution. I, they're not necessarily the only solution. I think um, when we talk about technology, we should also be talking about open source software and just making things public domain as opposed to it being, you know, owned by a company. I love the idea of co-ops and I think we should have an industry with many more co-ops than we have now. Do you have advice for individuals who are going into the tech industry and still want to work as ethically as possible and to still do good? Do you actually believe that that is possible? I definitely don't want to be too pessimistic. I think there is a range of possibilities in the, in the industry and 
there's a big spectrum. It's not all doom and gloom. There are smaller companies and even some larger companies that have more pro- progressive values. But at the same time, I think it's it's hard because the companies that are more likely to have good values are also less likely to pay you as well. They just don't have as much funding. Their business models are less lucrative. Um, and so I think anyone who is entering the industry and is thinking about ethics in this way will have to just be very honest with themselves about the trade-offs they're willing to make. You know, if you wanted to work only in social good roles, if you wanted to work for nonprofits, there aren't that many of those roles out there. And the ones that do exist are not going to pay you as well as writing machine learning for Uber. And so, you know, it, it all comes down to like, what are you willing to put up with? What are you willing to take? What sacrifices are you willing to make? But I do encourage people who are about to enter the tech industry to try their best to look for a role that aligns with their values. And, you know, even to push recruiters and to say like, instead of just saying, okay, yeah, I'll just take this job, tell me recruiter, what is your policy around X? How many people on your team are like not white men or something, if that's what you care about? What is your company's perspective on like these ethical questions? I think it's worth trying to figure that out. If enough recruits do that sort of thing, then these companies will have to at least talk about these things, right? It, the, the industry works a certain way, partly because of the response it gets. And if, um, if enough prospective hires are pushing back and saying, we won't work for this company until they change this, that is going to have some sort of impact if, if the scale is high enough. If all of the uh, new graduates rose up and went, you know what, we're not going to join Google's internship program, I think that would have a massive change. Uh, Wendy, it would be irresponsible of me not to mention the elephant in the room, which is the current crisis. And I just wonder, COVID-19, do you feel like what's happening right now it might actually expedite some of the changes that you, you want to see? I try to remain hopeful, but I also just given what's been happening, it does not look good. And so I think there's there's a part of me that thinks, yeah, you know, after this, people are going to realize we don't have to run the economy the same way. But also, this is an opportunity for the more malevolent forces to take power, right? And so this is a good opportunity to just kind of, for those in power, just crack down and extract more money. What we're seeing in the US is like, the government is passing these bills that are not adequate to address the problem, but at the same time are transferring wealth to the already wealthy. This is what we should expect given the kind of political forces that are in power right now. And it's also, it's, it's horrible. It's horrifying. I'm worried that a lot of people are going to die. A lot of people are just going to be financially struggling and won't be able to make it. But also, yeah, I, I do hope that the fact of this crisis and the truths it has revealed about our economic system will give people this like broader vision of how else we could run society. The, you know, in the US, we have so many unemployment claims already. And, you know, we, we might be passing the Great Depression in terms of unemployment soon. There are so many people who didn't pay rent this month. Like that's, that's got to change something, right? And there, I'm sure there are people who are realizing like, well, we, we could just do this all the time. We, don't, we should just not pay rent ever. We should all just be able to, you know, survive on different terms. I do hope that this catalyzes, um, a different way of looking at the world. And I hope that it serves as an opportunity to reimagine these structures that bind us all. Because at a time when the virus is really just upending the social order, then you know we, we should realize that we don't have to abide by the terms that capitalism has set for us. We don't have to treat people only in terms of their market value. And you know, every transaction doesn't have to be a commercial transaction. We can just relate to each other as human beings who want each other to survive. Like we, we want to build a society with all of us. That's what I hope. In a funny sort of way, Wendy, it feels like it could go one of two ways. It could either go into this dystopian reality whereby bringing in track and trace is going to have a massive civil liberties issue whereby we're constantly being tracked for our movements, arguably for for tracking the virus. But of course, once that's out of the bag, it can be used for other things. That's one end of the spectrum. Although the other end of the spectrum argue, it could argue that quarantine might actually make us appreciate human connection, reorient our value system, make us realize that we've been doing these bullshit jobs that we don't need to do anymore and might possibly upend the system in that way. I mean, do you think we're heading for uh, utopia or black mirror dystopia? Yeah, great question. I think I think we're going to see a bit of both. I, I am very worried about the surveillance implications. Certain companies are just going to amass power during this. Like Amazon is expanding so much. Walmart 
is doing really well during this crisis. As these companies get more and more powerful, I don't think it's going to be utopia for most of us. I think for their workers, it's just going to be more the same. But I think the utopian possibilities are inspiring and worth talking about because as people who've been doing their jobs at a time like this, they they must have to stop and think like, why am I doing this? Why am I, you know, working on the advertising campaign for the 2020 Prius or whatever? Why does all this stuff matter? What is our economy actually for? All of the jobs that people are doing, like which jobs are actually delivering social value and which ones are just a legacy of the system that we have, which is geared around consumption and advertising and fossil fuels. Maybe, you know, after this, people are going to quit their jobs if they can, if they have the financial luxury to do so. And they're going to say, well, I want to do something else. Like, I don't I don't think what I was doing before is actually what I want to do. Um, I think there are more important things. I want to spend time with my family. I want to take advantage of all the amazing things this planet has to offer and not spend all of my time, you know, trying to climb that career ladder for something I don't even believe in in the first place. I do hope that happens. I think in the tech industry, um, this will serve as a wake-up call to some people. If you're if you're a white-collar software engineer and you can work from home and you know that the world is collapsing around you while you're trying to debug this like JavaScript thing, you're probably thinking like this feels weird. And I hope these people like lean into that discomfort and think, okay, why does it feel weird? What can I actually do about it? Um, how do I readjust my understanding of the world to find a better path forward? That's that's kind of what I'm hoping for. Are Silicon Valley doing enough? I mean, the, 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 something like coronavirus, COVID-19, feels like one of those sorts of challenges that the coder community would want to get behind. And I know we've seen examples of hackathons, massive hackathons, where people are trying to find solutions to this problem. But uh, do you think for the Silicon Valley company that actually uh, provided the resources or, or or community platforms to help us overcome this. This this would be massive for them, and it feels like they've been very quiet. I know I know you've talked about uh, briefly about WeWork and what if WeWork actually opened up all their spaces as healthcare spaces, all this this land and all these campuses that uh, Facebook and Google have. Why don't we turn the Facebook campus into a into a field hospital, for example? I mean, how do you think Silicon Valley? can do more before we abolish it? Yeah, great question. Um, I think anything that these companies could do that would actually help address the crisis in a substantial way would also probably not be popular with shareholders, right? But at the same time, I mean, we're in such a moment of crisis that maybe they could just do it and then people would be like, okay, that's fine. Right. But to your argument, Wendy, that surely at this at stages like this, shareholder return, and I know it's, you know, when you create a company, it's within the, the, the rules and the, the law of creating that company that you have to do good by your shareholders. But surely something like this should um, succeed that, should over, overcome that and make that null and void in, in moments of crisis. Shouldn't we, shouldn't we re-engineer the system in that way to, to force these companies to act like public services and provide the good that they should have been providing by paying their taxes in the first place? I, I agree. But at the same time, you know, the, the show must go on. Companies are still releasing their quarterly earnings reports. I've heard that Netflix had a really great quarter, as you can <laughs> imagine. And yeah, I think it's it's hard for people to snap out of it, right? Because the, the thing about capitalism is that it just feels so totalizing that, like you were saying in the beginning, it, it is hard to imagine the end of capitalism. It's easier to imagine the end of the world. And even though we're kind of at an end of the world type scenario, it's still really hard to shift out of that because we've set up all these in institutions. We have all these... Um, cultural norms that force people to behave in a certain way. I would love to hear tech companies and uh, like tech leaders actually sacrifice something substantial to deal, to do something about the crisis. I think the most we've heard is um, Jack Dorsey saying he's going to donate some money, which isn't really a donation, but it's just, he's just shifting ownership of um, some of the stock. And from what I've heard, it's actually, he actually promised to do more than that. And so this is just, um, you know, him trying to capitalize on the scenario. But yeah, I think there's a lot these people could do. But what I really want to see from Silicon Valley is I, I would love to see tech leaders act in a way that isn't just about making themselves look good, but is instead about actually reducing their own power. Because like the fact that we're in a situation where we actually do want Silicon Valley to step up and offer their resources tells me something is broken. They, sh they shouldn't have this power in the first place. Um, the fact they do is, you know, 
something we just have to deal with. But like, why, why does WeWork have leases on so many offices? Why it was WeWork still making its cleaning staff come in to clean these empty offices without protective equipment? Like, why does it have the power to do those things? Well, because they got all this money from SoftBank. Why did that happen? I think, you know, once you start kind of asking these questions and you realize that the power that these companies have, the the wealth, the resources they control should not necessarily be under the purview of these private companies in the first place. And, you know, you know, if I'm going to try to like end on a nice note here, it's let's imagine a world where we don't have to beg Silicon Valley billionaires to donate some money to deal with COVID because we have the democratic institutions to do that in the first place. You're a Cody, you're a software developer at heart. I mean, that's what you uh, you grew up doing and, and you grew up loving to do. I mean, uh, deep down, does it make you a little sad that by abolishing Silicon Valley, the rapture of the nerds is never going to happen? I, I hope I've moved on from that. <laughs> but, I, you know, I think when I talk about abolishing Silicon Valley, I'm not saying that no one gets to code, right? I'm saying that the people who want to code and to, to build things, they get to do it in a, an environment that actually respects their talents. And recognizes the needs of the rest of the world. So in that case, people who are listening to this podcast or, or watching this live stream, in what way can they engage in the sorts of radical politics that you're talking about in this book to eventually upend the status quo as it is now? How do we not just envision that better alternative, but how do we actualize that better alternative? Mm, oh, amazing question. Uh, I wish I had more concrete answers. I think we're, we're living in a really weird moment where it's very unclear to me what's going to happen. And so I don't really know you know, what are the best avenues to address this? I think the the most promising things I'm seeing come from worker activism within the tech industry. And so we have groups like Tech Workers Coalition, which, you know, has branches in many US cities and also in, in the UK. That's that's really interesting. I think there are, there are people who are just doing like local activism or some sort of like electoral electoral politics where they're they're trying to make things better in their communities and they're advocating for you know, in San Francisco, we have a huge homelessness problem. And there are people here who are advocating for changes to that. They're, they're saying like, well, the part of the reason rents are so high is because we have all this tech money flooding in. And so there, you know, there was a ballot measure in San Francisco to basically tax tech companies and use that money to home, to fund homeless shelters. Um, and I think that's, that's useful. Like, so it's a way of connecting in people's minds that the problems are linked. Yeah, I think, you know, I'd recommend people get involved in your community, find some sort of like activist group that appeals to you, talk to your coworkers, um, and just also like take care of yourself. I think that should be step one in a pandemic like this. Like as much as we should be thinking about what comes after, we also have to just deal with the here and now. And it, it can be really hard. Like I'm having a lot of trouble just coping with everything. Like every, every day the news just seems so dark. And the most important thing is just like, we all just need to get out of this. and keep each other safe. And on that note, thank you, Wendy, for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. This has been great. Thank you to Wendy for sharing her thoughts on how we can create a much fairer tech ecosystem. You can find out more by purchasing Wendy's new book, Abolish Silicon Valley, How to Liberate Technology from Capitalism, available now. And don't forget, you can watch the full unedited video of this conversation at futurespodcast.net, where you can also find out about all of our live stream events. If you like what you've heard, then you can subscribe for our latest episode. Or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Futures Podcast. More episodes, transcripts, and show notes can be found at futurespodcast.net. Thank you for listening to the Futures Podcast.